I've got theorem 8 up here on the board. Obviously, we're going through these theorems in a slightly different order from your textbook, since theorem 9 was in the last video. Theorem 8 would actually be used to prove theorem 9. Theorem 8 tells us about evaluating limits of function compositions, and theorem 9 then said that if you compose continuous functions, the results will be continuous. Of course, the way you prove that is by evaluating the limit as you approach the point and showing that that was the function value. Okay. So what the theorem says is that if f is continuous at b, and b is going to be the limit as x approaches a of g of x. Now, g of x is going to be the inside part of a function composition. So then we're going to have the limit as x goes to a of f of g of x. So there we do see g of x is the inside part. And so here, we're taking g of x, we're plugging into f, and then we're taking the limit. And this theorem says you can interchange the order of those last two steps. You can take the limit of g of x and then plug that into f. So you're essentially pulling that limit inside. And of course, if that limit is b, then this just becomes f of b. So I've got two examples up on the board for us to see how this works. So I've got the limit as x goes to 0 of sine of x squared over x. So here, x squared over x is my inside part that I'm plugging into sine. Okay. And I can sort of see, this is telling me where x is going. Here's where all my x's in the expression are. That sine is kind of in the middle. It's separating the thing that's telling me where x is going and the part of the expression that has x's in it. So it really is nice if I can pull that limit inside and say this is sine of the limit as x goes to 0 of x squared over x. Now, I can do that if this limit is a finite number. According to theorem 8, I can do that if I'm going to get some number and my outside part, sine, is continuous at that number. Well, I know the domain of sine is all real numbers, and sine is continuous on its domain. So as long as I get any number, this is OK. But I'm going to just make that note. This is OK if the limit is a number. If this limit ends up being infinity or negative infinity or does not exist, then I'm not allowed to do this. Because writing something like sine of infinity or sine of does not exist doesn't make any sense. <laughs> but very often, I don't know what the limit is until I pull it inside and evaluate it. So if it ends up not being a number, I know to come back to this step and erase my work or cross it off because it doesn't make sense. But let's see. If I want to evaluate this, I can just cancel a factor of x. So this becomes sine of the limit as x goes to 0 of x, which is just sine of 0. 0 is a number. Now that I've evaluated the limit of that inside part, I know for sure this was legal. And sine of 0 is just 0. <laughs> so it's really nice because it allows me to focus on the part of the expression where the x's are, take the limit, and then plug that result into my function. So let's try that here. Okay. This is a composition. We're taking this rational function and plugging it into arctan. Okay. Now, I know that 2 is not in the domain because it would make the denominator here 0. I know that arctan is a continuous function. So I'm going to pull that limit inside. I'm going to say this is arctan of the limit as x approaches 2 of x squared minus 3x plus 2 over x minus 2. Now again, I'm doing that, and I'm sort of crossing my fingers and hoping that this is legal. I'm going to need this to be a number that's in the domain of arctan, because I know that arctan is continuous on its domain. Again, the domain of arctan is actually all real numbers, because remember what arctan looks like. We've got horizontal asymptotes at pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, and it just climbs in between those asymptotes. Okay. So this is also OK if the limit is a number. So we'll hope that it is. <laughs> but now I said I can't plug in 2 because it would make the bottom go to 0. Does it make the top go to 0? 4 minus 6 plus 2, yes, it does. Okay. 
So we've got an indeterminate form here where top and bottom both go to zero. I'm just going to bump up to the line above this to keep working. So we're going to have arctan of the limit as x goes to 2. We've got x minus 2 on the bottom. I want to see if I can factor the top. And it looks like that factors very nicely as x minus 2 times x minus 1. So I can cancel those and we get arctan of the limit as x goes to 2 of x minus 1. Well, now that's a continuous function, so I can just plug in 2. We get 2 minus 1, so it's arctan of 2 minus 1, which is arctan of 1. And now I just need to remember how to evaluate that. If that's one of my nice angles, or if it has a nice angle as its reference angle, I want to be able to evaluate it. If not, I'll just leave it as arctan of 1. Often when I'm evaluating inverse trig, I find it helpful to give it a name that makes me think angle. So if I call this thing theta, what we're saying here is that tangent of theta is 1 and, because this would have infinitely many solutions, but there's only one angle that's equal to arctan of 1, I also know that theta has to be in the range of arctan which is the interval from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. Now notice that corresponds to quadrants 1 and 4. If tangent is 1, which is positive, we're not in quadrant 4 because tangent would be negative there. So we're in quadrant 1. We're looking for an acute angle whose tangent is 1. That's going to be pi over 4. So my limit is arctan of 1 which simplifies to pi over 4. 